Whose side are you on? That does settle a little bit on the riots that followed the murder of three girls in Southport, the injury of several others, by a knife attacker. But it's quite odd, wasn't it? A protest against a murder. You don't normally get protests against a murder. It's just a crime. The police try and hunt the person down and that's it. I mean, no one protests against murder because everyone pretty well agrees that murder's wrong. But look at the Soham murders where uh, two girls were killed in that little village where there was huge protests after. No, not really. Uh, whereas in this case, you ended up with a mob sort of trying to attack uh, a mosque. Another group in London shouting things like, stop the boats. Now, I'm going to think this through quite carefully. Hopefully it will be helpful. Because my fear is at the moment that for some people, their sense of tribal allegiance overwhelms their moral judgment. In other words, they think, I'm on this side of the debate, so I'm going to approve of what these people do. And those people are on the other side of the debate, so I'm not, not going to listen to them. They're all wrong or whatever they do is bad. Um, so I'm going to try and go beyond that and move beyond polarization. Now, in moving beyond polarization, uh, I'll be doing something much more helpful than Hamza Yousaf did in calling these protesters scum. I mean, Hamza, what are you doing? I mean, I'm so glad he's not first minister anymore. Even if you think these protesters were completely wrong in what they were doing, completely misguided, surely part of what you want to do would be to win them over for them to see that they're on the wrong track. And at least for some of them, for them to, to see, oh, you know, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to head in a different direction. What's the chance of that going to happen with people like Hamza Yousaf calling people scum? I mean, that's one of the best ways to cement people in their p position is to be absolutely outrageously insulting to them. Now, before I get into the other things, I'd just like to acknowledge a few things. Uh, do the police have double standards uh, in Britain and in Scotland? They certainly do. Uh, if it's a protest for, say, Black Lives Matter or pro-Palestine or something, very gentle policing. If it's something that they see as under the banner of far right, then they'll come down like a ton of bricks. That's completely wrong. Everyone should be equal under the law. Uh, do I believe that sometimes the motivation for terrorist attacks, Islamic terrorist attacks, is covered up? So where you have someone shouting Allah Akbar while they're stabbing someone, and then the, it comes out, you know, it was a mental health issue. It wasn't terrorism, nothing to do with Islam, mental health issue. So do I think there's a move by the police, the mainstream media, political establishment to cover up some Islamic terrorism? Uh, yes. Uh, do I believe that the mainstream of public debate tries to make out that the main problem, the real issue with regard to Islamic terrorism is the backlash, is the far right response to it. That's the real issue. Do I agree with that? Well, no, uh, of course not. Even though some of the response might be unhelpful, uh, to say the least, uh, that doesn't make it the main issue. When, after a terrorist attack, when people say, we should, oh, we should just, let's just forget about it and move on. Uh, well, there's sort of something in that. Ultimately, that's what you hope a community will be able to do. Okay, we want to deal with the issues. So that's sort of half right. We do want to get on together, build bridges and move forward. So that's half right, but it's not the full picture by any means. Now, this murder has attracted attention in particular for a mixture of three reasons. I think race, um, culprit, a black man, it seems, victims, white, or it could be immigration status. Uh, the murderer, uh, allegedly, uh, from a different, or family from a different country, and also people have suggested, we don't know if it's true or not, probably isn't true, people have suggested that it might have been a Muslim. Now, if you were to speak to some of the protesters in one of these events and ask them to disambiguate their motivation, you probably wouldn't get a very clear answer. It'd be a sort of a mixture of all those three. So I'm going to go through them one at a time to try and think clearly about each of them. Right, let's start off with Islam. Well, there's three aspects here. It might be that the person themselves was a Muslim. It might be the person, the, the person who's committed the crime was a Muslim and that was the motivation for their crime. Or it might be also that their mosque or other online influences or whatever, other organisations influence them and radicalise them in that direction. Now, I'd imagine when this crime was first committed, there would have been a significant number of people in Britain who would be just desperate for the murderer to be a Muslim. Just desperate, because that suits their, their narrative. That, that would mean they're going to have a field day this week promoting their cause. Um, and I think that's why the rumour that he was a Muslim started, because people were desperate for that to be true. I think something's gone wrong if you're in that mindset and you hear about an atrocity that's been committed. Now, if someone's a Muslim, is it possible that the reason they committed an atrocity like this was actually because 
that are drug addicts or they've got a mental health problem? Well, yes, it's possible. Now, maybe some of you are going to get angry then and say, oh, please say that, it's not true, it's not true. Yeah, I'm saying, is it possible? Maybe in some cases, that is actually the reason. Maybe it, was a, it might have even been a mental health problem that expressed itself in sort of religious hysteria, or however you want to, to put it. Now, if a crime is motivated by Islam, well, which is not unusual, there have been a lot of cases uh, where that has happened in Britain and obviously around the world as well. Uh, that's something that we need to be open to the possibility of. And now, it's not just a lunatic fringe of Muslims who support terrorism around the world. For example, when the 9-11 terrorist attacks happened, look at the response in many Muslim-majority countries, people singing and dancing in the streets in celebration. If you look at Muhammad's life, I mean, Muhammad was involved in a lot of violence in his life, and he was very harsh to his uh, enemies. And the foundational texts of Islam commend a pretty harsh and you know, violent response to enemies of Islam. Now, I think that's, that's sort of indisputable. I think many Muslims now interpret the Quran, interpret the life of Muhammad, the same as of Muhammad. They interpret it in a different way. You know, that was then, this is now, and they don't think they need to follow those aspects of Muhammad's example, which is great. And I think in Britain, that's probably the majority of Muslims would take that sort of view. But in this case, in response to this, these murders, um, a group went and tried to smash up the local mosque. Now, let's imagine even if this, if the murderer had been a Muslim, even if that was his mosque, and I don't think either of those things are true, I'm not quite certain, and even if that mosque had radicalised him, there was extremist teaching there that was pointing people in that direction, even if all those things were true, what should be done? Well, that should be reported, and that's a crime. The police should investigate, that's incitement to violence, there should be prosecutions, there may be the mosque shut down, and that has happened in Britain. The police have investigated mosques and they've been closed down because they're seen as centres of radicalisation. So that's the proper way to deal with that. Now, let's say, again, if the murderer was a Muslim, it was his mosque, and the mosque came out and released a statement and said, well done, you've been a good Muslim, you've done exactly what we wanted you to do, we hope more people commit crimes like that. Now, if an angry mob formed outside that mosque and burnt it to the ground, would I, I'm not sure I would say I would condone it, but if I saw that happening, I wouldn't be too uh, upset about it, to be honest. I'd probably be thinking, well, okay, that's, that's justice being done one way or another. Um, in that case, but that's a pretty extreme case, isn't it? But what happened here is it seems to be the attack on the mosque was based on false information. And that's always the problem with vigilante action. When people think we're going to take the law into our own hands, then the proper process is not followed. People are really fired up. Uh, emotion takes over and it can be pretty vicious and misdirected. That's the history of vigilante action through the ages. Now, there's also a report circulating that a man with a machete was intercepted by police on his way to the vigil for the murdered girls. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't even know if he was a Muslim or not. Now, the problem is, if that's true, it's, is it possible that the police and mainstream media have deliberately decided not to report it? Now, I think it is possible that that's what's happened. They've said, oh, no, the last thing we need is this in the news. This will just cause problems. Let's keep this secret. Uh, you know, we maybe release the details later. I think that strategy backfires because it make, just makes people suspicious and fear the worst. So police, if a man was arrested with a machete, tell us and tell us what you know about him. And if there wasn't, tell us. It's pretty straightforward. The truth is the best policy. So in terms of Islam, people who've got concerns about Islam, I think they can be very rational, genuine concerns. I said there have been several terrorist attacks, obviously involving a tiny minority of Muslims, but it doesn't take many to cause huge uh, devastation and tragedy as a result of them. Um, but Muslims can also have some other quite extreme views. Okay, not all Muslims by a long way, but some do. Uh, for example, a desire for domination or to impose Islam on a nation. And that's a view that perhaps a substantial proportion of Muslims would hold to. Now, my two stories of hearing shocking things from Muslims, I mean, one of them was Ed in Edinburgh Central Mosque. A few years ago now, they have a, an Understanding Islam exhibition at festival time. And I went in one day looking around, it's, it's quite interesting. And there was a panel, Islam and Human Rights. So we've got the curator, you know, the official from the from the mosque who was there on duty. 
I said to him, oh, this is, this is interesting. I said, um, in a lot of Muslim majority countries, isn't there the death penalty for people who mock Muhammad? And the young man said to me, um, oh, oh, yeah. He said, we're not hotheads here. We're not hotheads in this mosque. He said, if someone mocks Muhammad, you lock them up for three days so they can come to their senses and retract it. He said, but if they don't do that, if they won't do it, well, they bought it on themselves, didn't they? I thought it was quite shocking. Uh, but I'd say, I'm sure that's, I'm sure Edinburgh Central Mosque will say that's Italian representative of their view. But that was what a person that I was speaking to, an official there, said to me. But another thing was, I, I've done a debate with a Muslim in Birmingham a few years ago. And I went for a meal with a group of Muslims. We went for a curry. It was very nice. We really enjoyed it. We had, we had a great chat. And I was talking to one of them. And I said, what do you think about uh, democracy? I think it was a college lecturer. He said, well, it's quite a nuance for you. He said, we're in favour of democracy, uh, but under an Islamic ruler. So like in Iran, you have an Islamic ruler who's the ultimate authority, but then you elect a president and a government and, and they deal with the details of running the nation. But the Islamic uh, authority, the Islamic leader, has got authority over them. Uh, they can set parameters on the way that the country is run. Now, again, uh, it's quite surprising talking to a professional person, you know, walking along in Birmingham. Uh, but that was what he explained to me. Now, th those sort of views concern me, but a lot of Muslims say don't hold those sort of views. Right, that's Islam. What about immigration? Now, immigration, there, there are lots of potential problems with immigration. There are some benefits as well, but some of the pro uh, focus on the problems for the purposes of this video. Obviously, illegal immigration is a problem in itself because it's a crime and leads to resentment in the host population. They feel they've been cheated, basically. Now, immigration on a mass scale or a rapid scale uh, can re result in cultural change and can influence negatively cultural cohesion, societal cohesion. And there can be practical problems as well. If you add massively to your population, then there can be practical problems about providing services, housing, etc. And also there's the possibility that immigration of some types might have an influence on crime as well, might increase rates of crime. Now, thinking about illegal immigration, illegal immigration, as far as I understand it, is mainly young men who are sent by their family as an investment because they can make far more money here for a couple of years than they could at home. So the money on, with the people traffickers is the investment. And then the return is the money the person earns you know, at a car wash or whatever, doing some probably quite basic job in Britain. But the exchange rates are such that the money they earn is life changing for the family back home. So you've got a young man arriving. He shouldn't be in the country. He's arrived illegally. So he's already in a criminal mindset. He can't get a regular job because he hasn't got any sort of work permit. You're not exactly in poor position to get a girlfriend. Your language skills are very poor. You're in a sort of dead end job. Uh, you're surrounded probably by a, a subculture of people from your own country. Um, and so is that a context for crimes? That sort of person that's likely to be committing crimes? Well, it's very, very likely. And I think it's perfectly reasonable for a nation to say to this type of illegal immigrant, we just don't want you. We don't want people like you coming to our country and you know, they should they have, the right, have the right to be able to enforce that. Now, maybe, of course, some illegal immigrants uh, may arrive and you know, go on to be wonderful citizens. Okay, that's not impossible. But as a general principle, I think doing what's necessary to stop illegal immigration is absolutely fine. So it's a valid concern, but still discussion about it needs to be sensitive because uh, it's quite delicate. If you're talking about immigrants, there's a, there's a huge number of people in Britain who would describe themselves either as immigrants themselves or from immigrant stock. Um, so whatever concerns are being discussed, it needs to be very carefully phrased in order to avoid a sort of scattergun offensive approach that doesn't really help anyone. Right, talking about crime rates, it's quite difficult to get statistics about crime rates and uh, race or uh, religion or uh, immigration status. Now, if you look at UK statistics, it's quite interesting. I've looked at the English ones, English and Wales in particular. If you want statistics about black people and the police, how black people are stopped for a stop and search more often, you can find a lot about how black people are victims of crime. What is harder to find is statistics about the race of people who commit crimes. Now, but this was something I found just from a couple of years ago. So it's saying the population, 85% white, 3% uh, black, 8% Asian, 2% uh, mixed, 
2% Chinese or other. And let's compare that with the prison population. Uh, so white, 85% of the population, 73% of the prison population. So I'd say that's significantly uh, lower. But then look at black, 3% of the population, 13% of the prison population. That is a dramatic overrepresentation in the prison population. Asian, 8%, prison, 8%. So uh, just uh, proportionate. Uh, mixed race, 2% in prison, 5%. So we get overrepresented. Chinese or other, 2% of the population, 1% of the prison population. So the main message from that basically is black and mixed race, but you know, mainly black, very, very significantly overrepresented in the prison population. Now, why is that? Well, we, we could discuss that. I think the levels of fatherlessness, family breakdown uh, in the black community are extremely high. I think maybe there are cultural factors, I, I don't know, that, that are having an effect. Difficult to know. But I find this quite odd to talk about. I mean, most of the black people I know at church uh, are at church. And they are, you know, to think of them as, you know, likely to make cr crimes or whatever. That, that's just, you know, completely bizarre. That they're, they're law-abiding people, you know, entirely. So it seems odd to be talking about this, but the facts are the facts. And uh, I say, there might be a mix of reasons responsible for that. Now, thinking about culture as well, with immigration, it can have an effect on culture. It doesn't matter what the person's race is, but it can have an effect on culture. So, for example, if you've got immigrants from a land where corruption is very common, if you have a particularly a big group gathering from that nation, then there's likely to be the assumption that corruption is the way things operate and that might take root. Similarly, you have a lot of immigrants from a certain uh, culture. There may be in that culture, if something happens you know, between you know, someone commits a crime, or whatever, you don't go to the police. You take a mob from your family round to the house of the other family and you take it out and you have a big argument about it. And again, that culture is uh, playing out in the streets of Britain uh, quite frequently. Again, attitudes to women. Uh, countries where attitudes to women are bad uh, will tend to import those attitudes uh, if we have a lot of immigration from those countries. But the historic one, gun crime. Apparently gun crime was virtually non-existent in Britain, but it arrived with a wave of immigrants from the Caribbean. Now, I like, I like the analogy. Immigration is like eating. You, you need some food to eat. There's such a thing as having too much food. There's such a thing as the wrong sort of food. Some sorts of food are just absolute poison. And however much food, even if it's the, wrong, or the right sort of food, you've got to have time to digest it. I think immigration is similar. I mean, think about this. I imagine Britain took in a million Australians. Okay, what, what impact would that have on the culture? Compared to, say, taking in a million Palestinians, that would be a vastly different uh, outlook. Th those two situations, vastly, vastly different. Now, I, I believe, read a book about this recently, that a nation doesn't have a duty to allow anyone to come and live in it. Okay, okay we, we've got like the, um, the, the refugee charters. Okay? I'm not disagreeing with that. But people who just, just want to move for a better life, you know, they just decide they would prefer to live in your country. A nation doesn't have a duty to offer a place to anyone to come and live in their nation for those sorts of reasons. So they can put forward whatever criteria they like for uh, immigration. Now, within a nation, you want, you want a united population, you want a shared identity, and that takes an effort. Whereas recently in Western countries, the philosophy has been multiculturalism, which means you say, we're not going to try and create a shared identity. You live in your world, we live in our world, some other people live in their world, and that's just lovely. And I think the evidence is that it's not. We need more common identity, more common grounds to be a healthy society. Now, at the protest at Downing Street, people were shouting, stop the boats. Now, Hums Yusuf, again, I mean, Hums Yusuf is just unbelievable. He said that phrase is a far right phrase. If you say stop the boats, yeah, that shows you're far right. I mean, that's just totally bonkers. Stop the boats is just a quick slogan that means stop one means of illegal immigration. Hums Yusuf think that's a sign of being far right. Thank goodness he's not the first minister anymore. But as it happens, stop the boats, that's got nothing to do with these murders. Again, some false information made it seem as if it had at an early stage, but it actually hadn't. So are the protesters blaming immigrants? Well, it sort of sounds like it to some degree. 
But of course, millions of people in Britain are immigrants or second generation immigrants. And to hold a vast group responsible for the crimes of one person or a tiny number of people is obviously, obviously wrong. Now, a few weeks ago, I spoke at a church in Edinburgh and pretty well ever in the church were people who'd come from Hong Kong as refugees uh, relatively recently. And there they were in the church. Now, if anyone suggested, you know, said to them, right, immigrants are the problem here. You know, they're committing all sorts of crimes. That would just be totally bonkers. Because the people in that church, I, I would be amazed if their rate of crime was any higher than any other group you'd like to look at uh, in the whole of the UK. So you've got to be specific. Now, with this case, uh, it, people are still pointing out that immigration is the issue for this uh, alleged murderer in Southport because they're saying he's the child of immigrants. So he's not an immigrant himself, he's the child of immigrants. Now, what do people mean by that? They could mean he's been brought up in an alien culture, in the culture of the, his immigrant parents. But I think what they're really getting at is race there. Because if someone who was born here, they're saying you know, he's not really properly British, properly Welsh or whatever, then I think race is actually at the heart of it. Now, so let's look at the third issue here. Now, race, of course, as a political issue is a total dead end. It should be seen as entirely irrelevant to all political considerations. No one can change their race. Now, some people might say seeing people of other races is a reminder of the level of immigration, even though some immigrants are not of, of other races. OK, but again, that, that's no logic for being hostile to people or wanting any sort of uh, restriction. I think racism ultimately is an expression of that unfortunate element of the human psyche and that is tribal hostility uh, th there's just something in people and it's stronger in some people than others that they just like to have a group to turn on and to really hate them and to enter into conflict with them and try and harm them whatever they just like to do that and there are people of that mindset will find a group in order to to do that with and um, so football hooliganism is the classic example I mean, there's obviously no rational reason to hate people of the, you know, the football team on the other side of town. But there's an awful lot of people who do do that. And I think it's no coincidence that some of these protesters at these events looked very similar to the sort of people you'd see being football hooligans as well. And I suspect that the reason for that is that in many cases, they will be sharing this vulnerability to enter into tribal hostility. Now, some of the protests as well were quite anti-Islam. Now, the same applies here. You can have valid concerns about Islam, which I've outlined some of them here, but there's also the possibility of having just a hatred or a hostility towards Islam that's not based on the on the facts. It's just like, yeah, it's the equivalent of like the football hooliganism. I mean, the reason fans of one club hate fans of another club, it's not because of anything rational that they just, they just enjoy turning on another group. And that sort of mentality can come out as well in anti-Islam sentiment. Now, when we think about the, the term far right, if I had to defo define far right, I would say it's an element of political view or whatever, that's a social opinion that is fueled by raw hostility. That's actually the driving force of it. So it's not fueled by genuine concerns. It's just fueled by hostility and hatred because the people sort of quite enjoy that. It makes them feel better. Or whatever that's what i would define as uh far right now, i've seen quite a few uh, x accounts uh, other things on social media well what they do in that output is they just put out a string of bad news stories about for example muslims or black people or immigrants and they, they just put one after another after another now if you're someone watching that if you maybe lack the intelligence to realize what's happening you will form the opinion Oh, these black people are really bad. Oh, these Muslims are really bad. These immigrants are really bad. And it will stir up hostility within you. And every time you come across someone from one of those groups, what will come to mind is, oh, they're probably a bad person. I've seen, I know what your sort get up to. Now, it may be that there's some forms of crime or bad behavior, however, are disproportionately committed by people in certain groups. But that needs to be based on analysis and statistics. And again, from the point of view of trying to solve a problem, not from the point of view of trying to stir up hatred and hostility towards a group. Now, inevitably at this point, we need to talk about uh, Tommy Robinson, who's been quite prominent 
and all of this. Now I'm just going to look at some of his uh, X posts to illustrate what I mean. So here we go. Uh, so he's talking about the alleged murderer in Cardiff. A proper Welsh Cardiff name that. In other words, his name sounds foreign. Therefore, he's not really one of us. So yeah, that this is a, a, some reason to be negative about him. That explains why he's a murderer. He's not a proper, not a proper English or Welsh person, whatever. He's a foreigner. Now, I think there's no other interpretation than that, than just sheer hostility to, to people who are foreign. I and mean, there, there's no rationality to it. It's just stirring up hostility to people who are foreign. Right, look at this next tweet. Kurdish refugee, someone or other, found guilty of attempted murder today, trying to push a postman to his death on the tube tracks for giving him a dirty look. Okay, right, terrible crime committed by someone, but the point is it's a Kurdish refugee. Right, had that same incident involved uh, a white person, then Tommy Robinson wouldn't have been pushing it. He wouldn't have been interested in that, but he, he selects a string of bad news stories about immigrants, Muslims, uh, about black people, etc. So that's why it's in his X feed. And say if the same thing happened the next day with someone who's white, he would not put it there. Now, for me, that's just a clear case of racism. That is racism or the just irrational anti-immigrant hostility. It's trying to stir up hostility towards immigrants. Uh, so not good. And the next one, Tommy Robinson uh, tweeting about the victims of the stabbing. And it says, our government failed you all. What does he mean by that? What he means is, our government failed you by letting immigrants in. So the two, the Rwandan parents of who we assume is the murderer, the government let them in. And so it's their fault that the murders took place. Right, th that is just a totally unfair comment. It doesn't make sense. I mean, who knows how good those parents are? Maybe they bear no responsibility whatsoever for what happened. Who knows? We don't know that yet. But Tommy Robinson's accusing, uh, accusation is the government lets in immigrants, so it's their fault when people get murdered. That is just irrational. But you can see the purpose it serves to stir up hostility against immigrants. Right, how about this one? Uh, so reading the tweet, the post is reposted. Uh, this man was spotted in Leeds touching young girls inappropriately in the garden, and this citizen acted accordingly. Uh, Tommy Robinson says it's every day in every city across our country. So a bit of vigilante action. Now, let's put the most positive possible interpretation on it. Let's say that maybe uh, the black man here was doing something outrageous. Maybe he was basically sexually assaulting young girls. Let's imagine that's true. And so maybe a citizen's arrest was the appropriate thing to do in that situation. But why is Tommy Robinson tweeting it? Would he have tweeted that if it was a black person who was restraining a white person uh, in, in a citizen's arrest? Of course he wouldn't. Of course he wouldn't. His point is to keep reaffirming, uh, keep reaffirming white people good, black people bad, and white people, basically you, you can take the law into your own hands there, it's sort of encouraging that. So I think that is reprehensible. Right, how about this one? Uh, the invasion of Northern Ireland continues. And that's a video. What the video shows is basically a group of Muslims coming in and having a picnic in a park. Now, describing that as an invasion, now the terminology invasion, the implication is an invasion is something you need to fight off there. And the fact that some Muslims have moved to Northern Ireland and having a picnic in a park, describing that as an invasion is just, uh, it, it, it's hysterical. It's hysterical. And you know, you, there may be valid concerns to talk about, but you're not going to make a positive contribution to addressing some of these issues by just stirring up hatred with language like that. Now, some of you might be saying, oh, well, Tommy Robinson's been victimized by the police, by the legal system. Uh, I agree. Or you may say, Tommy Robinson says lots of things that are true. I agree. Uh, but I think we need to be able to have two thoughts in the head at the same time about someone. Because I think the tweets there are examples in my book of trying to stir up hatred. And that's not good. Now, some of you might be saying, oh, but Tommy Robinson, he's the only one who will talk about it. Uh, no, that's just not true. There are lots of commentators and writers who will address these issues in a responsible, temperate, moderate, intelligent manner without stirring up hatred and hostility. There are lots of people who will do that. Now, Tommy Robinson's unique selling point, if you like, is he seems to be the best at communicating with people who do quite like the stirring up hostility element to it. I have to say I was quite surprised by Jordan Peterson 
uh, having Tommy Robinson as, as a guest of Ink un, and dealing with him fairly uncritically. I think that was an error. Now, what we saw last week as well was this incident of what appeared to be excessive violence from a police officer in Manchester uh, against a Muslim, an Asian, and it resulted in a Muslim mob attacking the police station in Rochdale. Um, and then in Southport, basically a black man murdered some white girls. So again, you get the white people protesting. Now, the root ideology here is the same. Look at the Black Lives Matter uh, campaign. Let's bring this in. A white man did something bad to a black man. Therefore, this is a race issue, so we're going to smash the place up and you know, demand change. It's all a race issue. Uh, and then with the issue in Southport, you get the same approach. It was a black murderer, white victims. So this is a race issue. So this time the white people have got to go and smash the place up because it's us and them. And when we look at any issue, we don't try and assess what's right and wrong. But the main way we look at it is, are they in our group or is it one of those other types of people? And obviously that is, um, it's not a moral, it's not a sensible uh, way to look at things. And it is just extremely destructive within a society. So that's why you're hearing from the protesters, from the likes of Tommy Robinson, saying things like the, the girls who were, who were killed were our daughters. Now, if some children of a Muslim family were killed, Tommy Robinson wouldn't be saying they're our daughters. Uh, now, when he says, you know, this is a tragedy, English girls have been killed. What he's meaning to say there, we're particularly bothered about that because they, they were white and like, ancestrally British victims. If it had been girls from another race, I mean, you'd have ignored it. Wouldn't have been interested. You know, let's find another bad news story about Muslims or black people or whatever. So that's a very dangerous approach to take. And my prescription to all this, talk about the issues openly, aim for harmony understanding in our society, promote a national identity, shared sense of national identity and pride. But at the moment, it's pretty hard to do that when uh, the dominant message is we're the worst country that's ever existed on the face of the earth. Welcome. You're part of us now. That's not a very attractive message, is it? Um, on some of these issues, you know, take action, including controlling immigration. Do whatever it takes to try and control immigration with a mind, with an eye on its impact on crime and terrorism, etc., etc. And I think we need to be quite ruthless in that. And the other thing I think we need to do going forward is to end what's effectively a bias against the native white British population. And that bias comes out in the way that people from other ethnic groups are favoured time and time again. And it results in resentment among white people. I think generally we're at the stage where people know if they apply for a job, then you know if, if you're a white male, it doesn't exactly go in your favour. And that leads to resentment, which contributes to uh, hostility. The other thing I would say as well, going forward in order to enhance community relations, if you like, is we need to stop worshipping or demonising immigrants. Because some people want to blame immigrants for everything, and that's the Tommy Robinson sort of thing. But then you get other people who like, like to say immigrants are the best people in the world. They contribute so much to our society and that they enrich us and you know, they're just absolutely amazing. So a person who's... You know, lived here for you know, many generations, families been here for generation after generation, they end up thinking, oh, well, you know, we're just boring, ordinary people. Those immigrants that have come, they're so wonderful and they've brought so much to our society. Again, that's it's, it's just not helpful. Just treat people the same. I mean, you all know lots of immigrants. Do you think they're like superstar angel people? Uh, no. Are they super bad people? No. Are they just like sort of everyone else, mixture, and you know, each got their own personality, character? Uh, yes. So I think worshipping or demonising immigrants is not helpful. Now, the people who... No, worship's too strong a word, but you know what I mean. I mean, the, the, the people who venerate immigrants, they would say the reason they do that is to counteract the people who try to demonise immigrants. I would say, but don't do it. It's counterproductive. It just leads to polarisation. The more you do that, the more people will push back against it. Now, just to finish, one final comment. I saw some of the footage from the riots and one of them there was uh, a man standing atop a police vehicle you know, waving his hands around in triumph you know police vehicles on fire and you have these scenes where the police are standing there meekly with their riot shields while people are throwing things at them basically trying to kill them you know they're throwing the biggest most dangerous objects they can as hard as they can at the police now when i say attempted murder they may be expecting that the police officer is not going to be killed because they're hiding behind a shield but their intention 
is to do as much harm as possible. And every time I see sign, uh, scenes like that, I don't care what the cause is, I don't care who's protesting about what, I just think that cannot be allowed. It cannot be allowed. If I was in charge of that, I would be looking to see what measures are necessary, what technology can be used, but just that is not going to happen on the streets of Britain. Because it broadcasts to the whole nation that law and order can totally break down and, and the police can be treated like that and you can sort of get away with it. Nothing happens. When people see someone triumphantly stamping on the top of a police vehicle, that video needs to include that person getting their comeuppance one way or another. Okay, right, so I hope that was helpful and interesting. Uh, some, uh, some new things to say. Do join the Scottish Family Party. There's a link below. And thanks for watching.